we could complain that the authority opened another Monday Night Raw. That John Cena is a 15 time WWE champion, which is this close from passing the speciality of Ric Flair. I'm hoping that WWE don't do this, but more than likely they're going to, which is not going to be good for business, not really. And how John Cena is on the front cover of the WWE 2015 video game. To be honest, I thought the cover was bland, boring, and could quite easily have been given to another talent member or a special moment that happened in the WWE. So I'm hoping this was just a way to get John Cena to follow the authority and it's not the real cover. But some positives did come out the opener. We had John Cena promising to give Daniel Bryan his uh, championship rematch. Even though I'm hoping this is not John Cena's way of regaining one of his losses in his career. We had the comedy from Stephanie dancing to the John Cena theme. I thought that was really funny. We had Triple H being a rapster to John Cena. Both authority figures were funny, entertaining, good way to kick off their part in the opener, which makes up for them being the uh, continuously opening the show and then we got the battleground main event made which is brilliant following a pay-per-view set up your next pay-per-view very nice it's john cena versus randy orton versus kane versus roman reigns and if uh, john cena managed to overcome triple h's match there's always option brock lesnar well option b triple h said but some people would expect it's um, Seth Rollins cash in because he's Mr. Money in the Bank now. Congratulations, Seth. But with the bigger story being teased of John Cena versus Brock Lesnar, nothing stops Triple H being in talks with Brock to come out and attack John Cena where and when needed, setting up the SummerSlam main event. Seth Rollins defeating Rob Bam Bam was best for business. The match didn't really interest me. I felt that Seth picking up the win without the authority or evolution was best for business. I even liked the fact that um, Seth Rollins got mic time after the match to talk about his briefcase winning and teasing his future. That was all good, but I felt the match was leaning a bit towards RVD's uh, strength and part in the match more than Seth Rollins. But after the match, after the promo, Dean Ambrose appears on Titantron. I'm really liking how the WWE are seeming to concentrate on this feud. It's great because the Shield were a great faction together and now they're looking good on their own. Ambrose promises whenever Seth tries to cash in, Ambrose will be waiting. So they're going to stretch this feud as long as possible. I have no problem with that. It's going to make Seth Rollins final cash in mean more because he's had to go through Ambrose to do it and I, I, I'm enjoying the forwarding of this feud and possible cashing. So following Rusev defeating Big E at Money the Bank in a big guy versus big guy pretty good match you're left wondering who's a step up from Big E who could be Rusev's next challenger it was Jack Swagger. Jack Swagger's not really came across as a threat. I, he, has, he does not feel like it's a step up from Big E. I, I really weren't interested. But I will give credit that the fans seem to like we the people. The crowd were loud with that. So this could help to turn Jack Swagger face. Especially if he's going to go against Rusev. But he's not the opponent I would have expected. But the other thing I'm going to compliment about this filler feud, part-time feud, is that it pulls swagger away from the news, what we heard later in the night. That sadly, Barrett is injured and he's going to be continue getting surgery and time to recover. Please get well soon, Wade Barrett. I want to see you back in the WWE and continuing your journey towards the main event 
or and the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. But at Battleground, there's going to be a vacant Battle Royal for the Intercontinental Championship. So Jack Swagger's possibly going to be against Rusev. So that pulls Jack Swagger, the guy who injured our Intercontinental Champion, making him have to uh, become champion no more. So I'm glad that Jack Swagger's not being, in a way, rewarded by being put into this Battle Royal. But we have uh, Cesaro being named as a participant as he goes into a match. And if the WWE weren't so stupid and cut an uh, ad break during the match, we would have seen Kofi Kingston defeating Cesaro. And I'm glad the WWE added on the Cesaro attack Kofi Kingston part after the match. Because it's like, no matter what the WWE tried to get Cesaro to do or get him to say, the fans want to cheer him. They want to be on Cesaro's side. So that's keeping more of the face than a heel. So this big beat down on uh, Kofi Kingston after the match was good. It's not really changed much because I don't think many people are as behind Kofi Kingston as they used to be so this attack on Kofi got some boos maybe some heel heat but I don't think it's really got enough for us to feel any difference to Cesaro the fast pace and furious match between the Wyatt and Sheamus and the Usos possibly showing or teasing at this part of Raw the potential feuds going forward Sheamus and Bray Wyatt, Usos, and the Wyatt family. So this was a good match. It got a good amount of time. And the Wyatts picking up the win was exactly needed. Especially what comes up late from the night. Teasing the new direction that Wyatt, Bray Wyatt, is going to be going in next. Even though I still don't see the falling of Bo Dallas... He's still a part of Raw, a character, a wrestler I look forward to watching on Monday Night Raw or SmackDown. With his silent treatment he gave to show respect to Daniel Bryan and Wade Barrett, and the only voice you could hear were the commentators finding it boring, complaining about it, thinking he fell asleep, only for him to wake up and finish his promo very entertaining. I don't know why the Bunker Dactyls, as soon as Broders Clay left, didn't change their theme. When I hear that uh, funky music, I think of Broders Clay. I do not want to think of Broders Clay. I want to think of the Bunker Dactyls. They needed their own theme for that temporary time of them staying together until this tease happened. And I expected the tease to continue at Main the Bank. Or at least join this match against Nikki Bella. I was expecting Cameron to turn on Naomi to give Nikki the win. But instead, Naomi picks up the win and then they tease the breakup. The breakup, I it should happen, but I felt it should have happened a while back to give us a new feud and a possible number one contendership for one of these two to become the Divas champion. I weren't a part of the express thing he had going on. I don't feel his time in the WWE has really worked. And now you see he's doing backstage segments involving Santino. Santino, yes, I still have my hopes that he could come back as our weekly entertainment guy. Because he's not going to be that serious Santino again. The intercontinental honk tonk meter guy again. Glamorella. That's sadly gone. But Adam Rose could benefit going back to NXT, doing more work from then, before eventually coming back to the main roster. Because the backstage segment, that party thing he did, celebrating partying with Santino to promote Twisted Tea, just filler, no, no, stop. I'm sure many fans like myself really jinxed Sandow tonight. When he came out as Vince McMahon, calling himself Vincent Kennedy McSandow, it was entertaining, he was getting compliments, it was funny. 
But when Steph appeared on the Titan Tron saying Sandow's disrespecting Vince McMahon, the authority who are giving Sandow and keeping Sandow in the WWE, puts him in a match against Carly, another participant in the uh, Intercontinental Championship Battle Royal, and Carly comes in and gives him one move and wins the match. I'm sorry, Sandow, we surely did not mean that we really thought you was going to be one of the many wrestlers who would quite easily beat Carly. I'm hoping something happens to you for you to be able to come back with full blast, full rage as a full heel again with your awesome mic skills. If not, the WWE are letting you down. As for you, Carly, I'm surprised you're not freaking fired. So the WWE had been teasing that a former WWE champion will be returning to the WWE. We all had our expectations of Chris Jericho. I teased that it's me returning to the WWE as I was hiding under the WWE ring waiting for my cue to come out. But no, the actual person returning to the WWE was the awesome one, The Miz. And as he's bragging about himself, giving us all the excitement, the guy, the wrestler, who was returning at the same time with the much bigger pop, much bigger fan reaction, was Chris Jericho. This was brilliant. And after he's taken down The Miz, after some good mic work between the two, out comes Bray Wyatt. You know, this whole segment was just brilliant. It went from not so much reaction for The Miz, to awesome reaction for Jericho, to a bigger reaction for the Bray Wyatt and Jericho stuff. This all added up brilliantly. But the thing is, is this Jericho-Bray Wyatt feud going to be to give Jericho his wins back? Or is it going to give Bray Wyatt his wins that he did not pick up over John Cena? I would like to see it level out between Jericho and Bray Wyatt because I really don't want to see this Bray Wyatt character continue to fail or begin to fail. Jericho though, I don't want to see him continue in a losing kind of pattern. But the feud itself, well done WWE, you've given us such interest in this. You've given us a possible going towards SummerSlam big match here. I'm glad the Sheamus feud finishes because I feel that as much as those two could have put on a good feud, a good match, having Jericho be a guy to put over or have a match feud against Bray Wyatt is more drawing. As for The Miz, well, Sheamus has a SmackDown open challenge for his United States Championship. Maybe The Miz could go after that. I'm pretty sure they're dishing the Ric Flair joining forces with The Miz, or maybe Ric Blair could try and save Miz's reaction. Yes, in my Money in the Bank review, I was asking you to please don't make this into a love square between Bandango, Layla, Samurai, and a, another diva, possible wrestler. But to add Ziggler to this, add Samurai and Ziggler together, yes, there's the theory that Ziggler only gets pushed when he has a diva by his side. But this whole lovely jubbly thing you've got going on needs to stop. It's not really working. Yes, there are some people that get excited to see love storylines. But Fandango just isn't working. Layla Samurai could be a feud. Ziggler going forward in a better capacity. He does not need this. Please end this. As soon as possible. Don't tease the continuation of this. Finish it. You could have gone with Stardust versus Ryback, Goldust versus Curtis Axel, vice versa, mix them up. But you gave us another tag match with the same result. Stars, the stars, won again. I may be looking forward at SummerSlam, like I said in the Main the Bank review. Possibly a, a group tag, the Wyatts versus Usos versus Rybaxel versus the Stars. Just some big match. Just not these repetitive 
ongoing, same matches, same results, things you're providing us. The WWE threw another surprise into this Monday Night Raw. We had Paige, who after speaking about that she deserves to be in the WWE, she deserves to be the Divas Champion, AJ returns. And after good promo work from both Divas here, I even give credit to Paige here, because yes, these are not male wrestlers, but my time in the Divas division is just important if the WWE ever really really concentrate on the Divas division but because of the WWE universe a rematch for AJ to regain her championship is made I don't know why the WWE did not wait until Battleground uh, or possibly pushed it until SummerSlam but push that logic to a side maybe this is to give a quick way for there to be a rematch at Battleground Either way, I think it was at the wrong place, wrong time. But I'll give the WWE the surprise factor for everything that's been going on during this Raw. So Cena and Reigns defeated Kane and Orton. After Reigns and Orton fight backstage, Kane smashes John Cena with the steel steps. And I find it really big of John Cena to stay down after the match, after Kane tombstones him. And then out comes Seth Rollins by the uh, signal of Triple H. And the cash in does not go because Dean Ambrose sticks to his words and prevents Seth Rollins for cashing in. And just when we thought that Kane was going to continue his beat down on John Cena, giving Kane a powerful finish to Raw for once, we have Roman Reigns running back and spearing Kane. So going into Money in the Bank, we had Reigns taking down Kane. Coming out of Money in the Bank, we have Reigns doing it again. So Kane's dominance or monstrous moments seem to keep getting put down by Roman Reigns. The thing that really stood out is you have Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins fighting in the crowd, showing their feud going forward. You have Reigns staring at Triple H. This is great because at Battleground, we have the Fatal 4-Way at SummerSlam. I wouldn't wait. There's rumours going round that Reigns and Triple H will happen at Night of Champions. Screw that rubbish idea. You want a big match going to SummerSlam. Reigns versus Triple H is it. Orton can wait till Night of Champions. It really doesn't matter. But this finish, you could hear that the crowd wanted this. The crowd want Reigns Triple H. Yes, it's putting Triple H back to the ring again. And as the COO, the future takeover of the company, maybe he should not be in the ring as often as he has been. But with this whole S.H.I.E.L.D. storyline, I'm enjoying it, I'm accepting it. And fans seem to want it too. So overall, a very good Raw. A few segments which I would crumble up and throw away. But share your thoughts in the comment section below. And tell me how much you enjoyed Raw. And has this got you ready for Battleground?